Hey guys, and welcome to Fika with Rice, a podcast about life hacks, inspirational life stories, routines, and keys to success. I'm your host, Frederick Van Hoon, and each week I meet some of the most incredible people in the world from self made millionaires, best selling authors, experts, and world class athletes. My goal is to extract their wisdom, mindset, tools so you can use them in your daily life, but above all, to inspire you. Let's get this Fika started. Welcome to episode 10 by Fika with Rice. This week we meet Jenny and Driver, a world-renowned body language expert whose New York Times bestseller book has been translated into 14 languages. A go-to expert in lie detection and body language for agencies such as the CIA and FBI. In this episode we learn real tactical advices on the importance of body language. We dive deep on how to look for cues when communicating and learn how we use our body language to communicate it whether we know it or not. A thought-provoking and fantastic conversation filled with nuggets on how you can learn how to decode anyone's body language for negotiations, meetings, or everyday life, no matter what profession. This is Janine's story. Let's go. Hello, Janine. Welcome to Fika with Rice. I'm really excited and honored to have you here on the show, and thank you for being here with me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, I thought by starting to ask, how does one decide to go from being a stand-up comedian working within law enforcement to become a body language expert and a New York Times bestselling author? Uh, So my background, that's a great question, is that, uh, is it Frederick or Frederick? You know, it's a good question. You know, I'm from Sweden, right? And it's Friedrich. But since... You know, in the U.S., it would be Frederick, right? But let's make it simple. Why don't you call me Fred or Freddy? Fred. All right, Fred, Freddy. So uh, my background is my degree in college was English communications with a concentration in public relations. And that's going to come in handy as I walk you briefly through my journey from law enforcement to stand-up comedy to body language expert, New York Times bestselling author. So My degree was in communications, radio, TV, and the newspaper. I didn't really like the newspaper uh, aspect. I have a little bit of dyslexia and I have ADD. So it's a little bit of a challenge for me to focus on writing. And my, my specialty, the thing I loved was public relations. I found it to be interesting and how to get someone on television or in the newspaper and radio or any of that stuff. I thought it was really cool. I had great teachers in the Berkshires of Massachusetts here in the United States of America. So uh, I end up in law enforcement, uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, it's called. Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms. My dad said I'm his daughter who turned her hobbies into a career, drinking, smoking, and shooting. I don't do any of those things half as much as I used to, uh, Fred. And so I ended up in law enforcement with ATF. They came to my school, so I got the job right at 21. Was with ATF for 17 years. Well, if you work for a law enforcement agency, you're kind of being trained to look for the negative and to look where the problems are. And for me, I'm a positive person. My mother was very positive. My dad's pretty positive. And so it started to wear on my soul. So when I moved to New York City, I did stand-up comedy on the side. I took a class through a company called The Learning Annex. You'd have this little brochure. You could take a class, how to cook, speed dating. I was like, stand-up comedy? It was like a 12-week course. The last class, you got to go live on a stage. And I just thought I'd go once to say I did. I once did stand-up comedy on a stage in New York City in some future game where people say, like, say two things about you that are true and one thing that's a lie, Freddie. You know? And I'm like, well, I'm going to be able to say I did stand-up comedy once. Well, I ended up doing it. I became good friends with the manager, a guy named Tim Davis at Stand Up New York, 78th and Broadway in New York City. And Terry Moore, another stand-up comedian. I've performed with um, Zach Galifianakis from all the Hangover movies numerous times. Every night, I have videotapes of me performing with Zach Galifianakis. Um, A guy named Jim Gaffigan. I don't know if you heard of him. And the list goes on and on. And so did stand-up at night and weekends to add levity to my government job. I worked at the World Trade Center in New York City. And so I would do this nights and weekends, put dating on hold. Comedy was a priority to give me that levity. And then my, my comedy coach, this guy, Tim Davis, said to me once, you know, the way to make money is not um, through stand-up, Janine, because you make 50 bucks here and there. It's through being a motivational speaker, combining education with motivation and comedy. Well, ATF had taught me how to separate fact from fiction, how to spot liars versus people who are telling the truth, times of questions to ask, body language, statement analysis, words that have secret hidden meaning. If you can listen to the words if you know what they mean behind it. 
you can, you know, I, my book is called You Say More Than You Think. You can realize people do say more than they think. So uh, that was programmed in my head. That kind of little thing that, you know, want to make money. I'm motivated by money. I love money. Uh, I love prosperity. I love abundance. And just as much as I love to receive, I love to give. One of my I am's is I am generosity. So I'm generous with my time, my money, my information. I know I'm my best version of me, Fred, when I'm serving others. And so I'm so blessed. I always say I'm just taking God's money and I'm, I'm you know, allocating it in different spots. I live in a very modest house in the suburbs of Alexandria, Virginia. Most people are surprised when they see where I live. It's just a split level house in a blue collar neighborhood. Uh, I'm a blue collar kid from Boston originally. So I like that vibe of this, you know, people walking their dogs and running and friendly and diversity. And I love that. So combining, you know, how I was raised with this advice that I got from this comedy coach, uh, I left the World Trade Center, worked at the FBI for a year uh, on what's called a detail. The FBI borrowed me from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And I started realizing uh, pretty, pretty, I'd say about, I worked for ATF for 17 years. At the 13 year mark, I was like, okay, it's run its course. I love the bureau. I love people who work there. I had great mentors and bosses and coworkers. I loved it. And I knew I was called to do something bigger. And so my brain, I bought a book called I Could Do Anything If Only I Knew What It Was by the Arthur Barber Shear, S-H-E-R. And I, I saw it in the store and I go, oh, that's my problem. I want to do something else, but I don't know what I could do. And so I bought the book and I literally did the exercises inside the book. And it led me to make a long story short, create a website called liontamer.com, L-Y-I-N-T-A-M-E-R.com, because I could tell if you're lion, lion tamer. And I created this website and I'm like, now how do I turn it into a company? I got permission from ATF. And I'm like, how do I become this body language expert? I didn't know I was going to have a book deal at first. And uh, so I create the website. So there's a, there's a great book out there. I don't know if you've heard of it, Freddie. Um, it's called um, The Game of Life and How to Play It by, by um, forgetting her name, The Game of Life and How to Play It. Uh, I'll look it up in a minute. So um, it's on, someone reads the book. It's black and white picture. Someone reads it on YouTube. And so I'm telling you this because in, that, in this little book, which has been around since 1920s, it says you got to see it, you got to believe it, and you got to act on it. Like if you have your dream house in mind, you want to have a house like I do. I want to have a house on a lake one day where I can open my eyes and I see a view of the lake and I have a boat right there. And I, I have a house over my little boathouse, a little bedroom for people to visit. So you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever store you have, handy, you know, handyman store, and you buy a key. So I have a key in my wallet that says home. And I got one for my best friend. I go, this is to my beach house on the lake. This is my lake house and gave her a key. So you get to see it, act on it and believe it. So for me, I bought this uh, marketing guy named Dan Kennedy. Um, he has this like marketing newsletter and some tapes. And, you know, I think he's like before Jesse Itzler and Chad and, and those guys. It's, you know, Dan, first came Dan Kennedy. And I watched this video and they were talking to, I was working for ATF. They were talking to restaurant owners and they said, okay, Freddie, if you, if you are an Italian restaurant, start saying you have the world's greatest meatballs because no one's going to knock on your window or your door one day and say, hey, Freddie, I want to say congratulations. You have the world's greatest meatballs. Claim it. Claim the title. And if someone says, no, I have the world's greatest meatballs. Now you get more publicity because now we have a cook-off and then there's a, we call it, we do a press release. We send it to the local radio station and now you get more publicity. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a world-renowned body language expert. And I'm a New York Times bestselling author. And I just started listing all these things. I went to ATF the next day. And my friend Ben and I always go to get a bagel every morning. And he knocks on the door. Driver. My last name's Driver. They call me Driver. Driver. Uh, bagel time. I go, hey, shut the door. Shut the door. And I go, sit down. He goes, what's going on? I go, you're not going to believe this. But uh, I'm out of here. I'm a world-renowned body language expert, and I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I go on TV shows. I go on radio shows. I'm like super famous around the world. And he goes, when did this happen? I go, last night around 9.35 p.m. And two weeks later, I was on Fox News with a guy named Tony Snow. 
at International Fox News. Then that was February 7th, 2013. February 14th, two weeks later, Tony Snow had me back for a Valentine's Day special. I put it on that website I had, I had created after that book. I could do anything if only I knew what it was. Create, I put these two videos on there. About six months goes by, maybe five. I get a, sh- a call from the, the Today Show. And the Today Show calls and says, hey, we see that uh, these segments you did on Fox, we want to do a segment on body language. Are you available at this time and date? I've since been on the Today Show, I don't know now, 10 years, over 100 episodes. I've been on Rachel Ray, Dr. Oz, Dr. Drew, um, Harry Connick Jr. when he had a show, CNN, Fox, um, Discovery Channel, BBC, um, just a little bit of everything, and documentaries. Um, History Channel, I think I said that one. So anyway, that's my story. It's it's kind of, um, it all threaded together. Steve Jobs would tell you, Freddie, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards. And so for me, everything all the way back to my degree in public relations, every time I would be hired by a company, I speak, my specialty is speaking to hiring managers, recruiters, and supervisors Because for every bad hire you make, you spend an average of $72,000 on that bad hire within the first year. And then worse than that is your company's reputation because now I fire the bad hire and what happens? They go on a website and badmouth your company and say bad things or make up things that aren't true. And then the hiring manager recruiter, they are embarrassed because they recommended you hiring the person and you're out all this money. So my specialty is anyone that is, has a company, is an entrepreneur, is thinking of hiring people. If you're a big company from Procter & Gamble to Coca-Cola, who's Alan Hamilton? And so every time a company hired me in the beginning, I would do a press release. I'd do a press release, do a press release, do a press release because I learned it in college. It's not a big deal. Google how to do a press release. You know, um, Coca-Cola invites body language expert Janine Driver back for encore performance. And then I get a quote that they sent me from my first time I was there. Uh, I give a quote. It's a one pager. It literally will take you an hour. And I started dumping press releases out there and it started my career. Eventually, I get on Rachel Ray and the Rachel Ray show did not happen easily. I sat back and I'm like, what show do I want to be on next? What do I want to manifest? You know, the power of manifesting. Boy, you ask me one question. I just run the whole show. So I'm almost done. So I, I literally wanted to be, I'm like, Rachel Ray, everyone's watching this show called Rachel Ray. It's a daytime show. And so I went on Rachel Ray's website and I looked at upcoming shows and it says, want to be a guest on the show? Like, hey, do you think your kids are smoking? Come on our show. You know, do you, are you about to meet your future in-laws for the first time? Come on our show. But I did it with a twist. And I said, hey, about to meet the future in-laws? Here's the three biggest make, the mistakes that everyone makes when they meet their, meet their future in-laws. Do you know what side to sit on of your future mother-in-law, the right or the left? Which one is going to make your life a whole lot harder? And then I just, do you think your kids are smoking? The five tells to tell if your kids have a secret that they're not letting you know about. And I just, I think I spent about three or four hours just writing to every single show and just twisting my stuff. Twist, twist, twist. And uh, they're each about a paragraph with three or four takeaways. And that was on a Wednesday, Freddie. On Friday, my phone rings. Janine Driver, Maggie Barnes, Rachel Ray Show. I go, Maggie Barnes, I've been expecting your phone call. She goes, listen, we want to do a segment with you. Now I pitched everyone, so I don't know what segment she wants to do. Ended up being a dating segment. I'm on the segment. A woman, Rachel Ray, forgets to bring out an extra chair. Her producers forgot an extra chair. This girl couldn't get a second date and I helped her. She went on three dates and I spied on her like I was a producer, but I was really taking all these notes on what she was doing wrong with her body language. To pretty successful, pretty rich, uh, owned her own house, but couldn't get a second date. What's the problem here? Could it be the body language? The answer is yes. She's now married. That woman's named Nicole and she credits me for this marriage. Uh, and. They surprised uh, Nicole and brought out her favorite date as a, for a second date. They didn't have an extra chair. So Rachel Ray looks around, doesn't know what to do. Just like you and I, look to the left, look to the right. And she decided to get up and sit on my lap. Well, there was an uh, a, uh, agent, a literary agent named Dan Lazar from a company called Writer's House. They've produced tons, written, gotten lots of book deals that turned into movies. And 
uh, the Stan Lazar is turning the channel, sees Rachel Ray sitting on my lap and says, what is this? Wait a minute. Could a pretty girl who's rich, successful, talented, educated, really not get a second date because of body language? Starts emailing me, emailing me, emailing me. I'm deleting, deleting, delete. I think it's a scam. You know, this story sounds familiar from my interview with Jesse Itzler, if you haven't heard it. Uh, so 30 days of excellence. So I'm like, delete, delete. And my phone's ringing. And finally I answered. I go, can I help you? I thought it was a scam. Because my Dan's, my name's Dan Lazar. Please Google me. You know, look at Writer's House. It's one of the biggest publishing, com- um, and not publishing companies. They're agents, literary agents. He got me a book deal then. I got for almost a half a million dollars with Random House, a book deal that the book was called You Say More Than You Think. I left ATF and retired at the age of 37. Four years after I had started, I gave myself a five-year plan to leave. So four years from when I bought the book, I could do anything if only I knew what it was. I think a lot of people, this is my last point. You can't get your, my next, your next question, Freddie. But I think a lot of people listen to a podcast or read really good books. Um, you know, I have a book right here, compete every, compete every day, right? So I, I, you may read like entrepreneur books. There's a great book, Psycho Cybernetics, that every human being, all, all the billionaires and millionaires have read it. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Uh, but anyway, you, yeah, so we, we can, we, we buy the books, we read the books, um, but we don't act. So we think about it, we can see it, we can believe it. Where I think the missing key for most people, Freddie, is the, the act. So the investment, it's, it's, you've got to take an action, whether it's buying a key to a house, whether it's writing a press release, whether it's me saying to my friend and telling my boss, when she asked me, I want to promote you to a supervisor. I said, oh no, I'm, reti- I'm retiring in, in the next five years. She goes, what are you talking about? You're 32 years, uh, I was 33. She goes, what are you talking about? I go, I'm retiring in the next five years. I don't want to be a supervisor. I'll stay at this grade. I was making $115,000 a year, grade 14, it's called in the government. And I was like, no, I'm good. And I told everyone unapologetically, I think a lot of people keep it a secret. I have a secret business and I have a, you know, I have a secret dream. And no, not for me. I'm not saying my way is the right way. I'm saying my way is Janine Driver's way. That happened to work pretty well for me. So I just told everybody unapologetically and they laughed at me. They talked about me behind my back. This one girl, Deb, every time she'd see me in the hall, I thought you were leaving. I thought you were retiring early. I thought you were becoming famous. And Love now that. that book becomes a New York Times bestseller. It's translated in 17 languages around the world. And I have spoken to millions and millions of people around the world through the platform of television, radio, newspaper. My second book, You Can't Lie to Me, is translated in 12 languages around the world. And that's a Washington Post bestseller. Whew. It's all amazing. With, that, all with one breath. Your yes. people, your, your viewers and listeners are going to have to rewind and play it like five seconds at a time. I'm from Boston and we talk <laughs> super fast and we never stop talking. So my mother used to say, hey, you made a living out of the thing you like to do the most. Talk. It's true. It is true. Like have a sip of water, Janine. No, thank you for, <laughs> for that. Uh, I, I think let's start with one of your biggest points, which is um, that people don't take action. I agree on that. Um, I, I'm an avid reader. I, I, I don't read one book a week like the average CEO. I, I read about one book per month, maybe every three weeks. But I, I don't recognize the book that you read, but one book that had a huge impact on me, it was also very, very old. It's from the 1920s, if it, which is the same like era as the book that you read, which is uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Yeah. And when I read that book, you know, it was in dollars. It was eight or nine dollars only. It's the best investment because when I, when I read that, I was like, all right, I need to be writing down my goals. All right, I want to build a multi-million dollar business. I want to I am on Forbes magazine. I can see like I can already see it, you know. It's just that it hasn't happened yet. It will arrive, but not yet, you know. And just taking actions every day, having a positive mindset and I think a lot of people read, but yeah, they, they don't do anything about that knowledge, you know. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm big on acting. I'm motivated to act. I'm literally motivated to act because I'll read a book and I say, who cares? So what? So what? Why do I care? I have a great book behind me over here that I'm reading right now. Um, it's, uh, hold on. I'm going to grab this book because I love it. It's a... Uh, Go for it. Uh, this is called Mindsight. Okay. Um, this is called Mindsight. And it's by a guy named Dr. Dan Siegel. 
But even if you don't read this book, if you go to YouTube and put in Dr. Dan Siegel, he has tons of YouTube videos that will change your life forever, especially if you're a parent. Um, but even if you're not a parent, and he, what he talks about is understanding the brain. And he gives a very good example of the top brain versus the bottom brain just by making a fist. If you put your thumb inside your fist for the people who are listening on the podcast, put your thumb and then make a fist with your, your fingers over it. He calls that top part the top brain and the bottom part inside the lower brain, downstairs brain. So upstairs brain, downstairs brain. If you open your fingers back up and your thumb is literally on the palm of your hand now, like I'm doing a high five, but I put my thumb on my palm. He, he talks about what are all these different aspects of the brain, everything from the brain stem to the pituitary, just all the parts. And it helps you understand, again, how to reprogram your brain to be successful. And um, I'm big on the brain. I'm big on, I, I'm motivated to learn new things. I always say I'm an eternal student and ultimately act. I'm always acting, acting. What can I do? Great. My book was a New York Times bestseller, what, 10 years ago? So what's my next big challenge that I'm working out for, which is I'm taking a stand for all the HR hiring managers and recruiters, because the only time we care, we really honor them is when it, they do it right. And when they do it wrong, um, I mean, when they do it right, we honor them for a day. But when they do it wrong, we talk about them for months and months and months. You know, it's a challenging role to be the person who says, let's hire that person. Because if you hire someone who, by the way, there's a body language tell that indicates that person you're about to hire is going to be a cancer within your company. And if you can spot this immediately, even in a Zoom, you because these people are very charming, confident, and you love them uh, in an interview. But when you bring them on board, they're a cancer. You're better to keep the, the position vacant. Otherwise, you're out $72,000 more than that per person, per bad hire. And beyond that is your company's reputation. So I'm really, I'm really big on, on helping, helping companies, especially entrepreneurs, just starting out, hiring the right people right out of the gate. And listen, I've hired the wrong people. So I've been there and uh, I've learned from my mistakes. What should one, be, let's say that you're an entrepreneur or you're working within HR, recruiting people, what, what type of body language should you be watching out for then? So the big one, the one that you should avoid at all costs is if you're in an interview and you see someone leak contempt. So there's seven universal emotions, Freddie. Um, ha and well, there's more than seven universal emotions. We all have all kinds of emotions, greed and hate and jealousy. But there's seven that show up on our faces in a very similar way. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're the Netherlands or China or the United States. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're three or 103. Then those seven are happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, contempt, and disgust. Happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, contempt, disgust. I said it again slower because I know I said it so fast. In case people are taking notes. I, li I yeah. like the slowness. <laughs> yeah, well, contempt. So contempt is moral superiority. So contempt is a smirk on our face. So contempt, Freddie, and you listening or watching on, at home or in your office, contempt is um, a smirk on one side of our face. It's the only unilateral expression out of the seven. And it's one side of the face is pulled up and in like a half a smile. It's like, we call it in the United States, the cat ate the canary grin. This is, we see Bernie Madoff did this look. We see powerful liars when they lie, will do this look. It doesn't belong there. Now, if someone leaks contempt when you're asking them a question as a hiring manager and recruiter about a trophy they won or an award, right? You're like, we understand that you won the blah, blah, blah trophy, you know? And, you are the, you know, you won the top sales position and, and they hold up their, you know, mentally imagining them holding up their trophy as I hold up a gold picture frame of, I don't even know what this, oh, it's New York City. And uh, they leak contempt there. It belongs there. Why? Contempt is moral superiority. So if it's, it's excessive pride. Um, so it belongs there if we're talking about your accolades. But in a job interview, if you as a hiring manager, recruiter, as an entrepreneur, just looking to hire one or two people, if you see contempt and you say, explain the gap in your resume, and they tell you, have you ever lost a position? Have you ever had a supervisor you haven't gotten along with? How did you turn the tide? And they leak that contempt. This means when, when the going gets tough, they are going to blame everybody else. It's unlikely they're going to take responsibility. So when people like athletes take steroids and lie about it on TV, or politicians lie about cheating on their spouses or stealing money or 
doing something illegal, um, you'll often see them link contempt. It's they almost think they think that they're better than you or better than the topic. It's very contemptuous. So sometimes highly educated people will leak contempt. You'll see it if you use a word incorrectly or if you swear. I say I'm a swearing Christian. If you swear in front of somebody and they don't like swearing, you can tell it because they may leak contempt. Like I may tell a joke and use an F-bomb or something and, and th- I can look around and one person leaks contempt. I immediately know or, be- you know, I think I'm like, they probably don't like swearing. Wow. I don't swear my corporate gigs. I won't be swearing here today. So. Oh, that's okay. Just when I'm with friends. Just when I'm with friends. <laughs> okay. No, that's a really powerful advice. Um, oof, my brain is just thinking now of everyone who's been doing that. I'm just re- thinking about past conversations, you know? Um, okay. But so before this, this conversation, I, I read that building up your emotional intelligence is really important when you're decoding somebody or want to spot somebody's body language. Why is that? So emotional intelligence is, you know, it's been around for a long time. Daniel Goleman is the like grandfather, considered the grandfather of emotional intelligence, but it was around way before him, right? And throughout our whole entire life. So your IQ versus your EQ, your emotional quotient is um, makes you a better supervisor, a better leader, a better mom, a better librarian. If you're people working with people, high emotional intelligence is very helpful. As a matter of fact, in sales, um, the top 10% and say, who sell at any company, the top 10%, they have high emotional intelligence, almost all of them, almost 100%. The bottom have a low emotional intelligence. It's not, it's not that they don't know what to do. There's an expression called the knowing and doing gap. Have you heard of this? Uh, no, I haven't, Janine. So the knowing and doing gap, okay? So people are listening to your podcast or they're watching this on YouTube or wherever you post this. Um, the knowing and doing gap is you know what to do, right? You have had sales training. You've had HR training. You know how to um, swim a race. You know how to hit a soccer ball. You, you have got the knowledge. You've read the books. You have the knowledge. If you're not doing in, in, in initiating that knowledge, if you're not acting on what you have been trained to do, that is called the knowing and doing gap. And that gap between the two is where emotional intelligence lives. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Michael Phelps. So Michael Phelps breaks this Guinness World Book of Records, the most amount of gold wins in an Olympic race, right? It was the Beijing Olympics. Okay, our president of the United States was there at the time, President George W. Bush, and uh, the whole world is watching Michael Phelps do this. When he goes to do the butterfly race, um, I think it's like his third race in, his goggles fill up with water. Now, is it is it the training that has helped him win the race? He wins the race. Is it the training uh, that has helped him, or is it emotional intelligence? Or could it be the combination of both? If he were to ask Michael Phelps, he would say, I'll give people at, at home a, a, a hot second to, to guess. Which one do you think it is? Well, I will put my bets on emotional intelligence now because we're speaking okay. about it. So it's both. So it's both, right? So he said he even trained what to do if the goggles filled with, with water. He visualized what he would do. He's visualized. What, he, we, what would he do if his bathing suit fell off? If his bathing suit slips off his body, breaks open, and he's now swimming naked, how does he still win the race and not get distracted by that? That we're the emotion, so he knows what to do. How come he's able to do it is because when the stress hits of the goggles filling up, the actual stress that's happening, the cortisol filling his body, when the stress hits, emotional intelligence begins to take the wheel and says, we've got this. And so emotional intelligence is critical to reading and decoding and influencing human behavior. Because are you, I'll give you a quick example. I recently taught, I do a, um, I'm a recovering hothead. I'm from Boston. I don't know. Sometimes us Boston people are known as hotheads. And uh, I, I don't like that. I live in Virginia, a little bit down the South here. In the United States, if you're not familiar with it, the more Southern you get, the more, you know, polite and manners people have. Uh, and it's a slower pace. And so I've been working on my hot temper. And so I did a class on how to, how to deal with your hot temper. And it was a webinar. 
Well, my contractor had been here at my house painting. I'm going to show you where emotional intelligence comes in. So my contractor was here painting my house, him and his family. It looks great. They clean up the bathroom. They leave Freddie like an 80 pound industrial vacuum. It's like very heavy. It's like lifting two small children, right? So in my bathroom, they forgot. So as soon as he leaves, I take a picture and say, hey, you forgot your 80 pound vacuum in my bathroom outside my shower. He goes, oh, sorry, we're already on the highway. Uh, I'll pick it up tomorrow. Now, I could have moved it, but I didn't. I'm like, well, I'm not moving. It's gross, it's dirty, it's covered in dust, it's 80 pounds. I now get on my webinar and I'm talking to the woman who's gonna, uh, who owns the company, her name is Tammy. And we're talking for an hour before the webinar. But I have to go to the bathroom because I'm doing this special program called 75 Hard. And we could talk about it later, but uh, there's certain things that you have to do on this health and wellness program. And it's really a mental program that's helping my health in the process. And one of the things you have to do is drink a gallon of water every day, right? So I'm drinking this water constantly. I'm talking to Tammy for an hour. The, the webinar is starting in five minutes. And Tammy and I both have the gift to gab. So I go, Tammy, if I don't go to the bathroom, I'm going to be my pants in your webinar. So I've got to run to the bathroom. I'm in my bedroom. Um, my two young kids, Charlie and Jack, are five and six. Before I called Tammy, I put them in the bathtub, but I forgot to give them towels. So now I'm done talking to Tammy. I'm going to run to the bathroom before the webinar begins, right? I hop over the 80-pound vacuum in my bathroom in front of my shower. What do you think is on the floor? What do you think happened when my kids got out of the bathtub without towels? What do you think's on the floor? It's a lot of water on the floor, right? A lot of water, Freddie, and you at home. There's a ton of water. I jump over, I'm in a hurry. I've had to go to the bathroom for about 20 minutes. I jump over the vacuum, right? I leap over and I land on the water and I go slam and I fall flat on my back, hurt myself a little bit. And now I'm soaking wet with water. And what do you think else happens? Yeah, I peed my pants. That little teeny like, boom, uh, now I peed my pants. I'm on the ground and I'm like, oh my gosh. Now, old Janine would have gotten mad, Janine, without working on her emotional intelligence, right? So who do you think I would have gotten mad at? Who would I have yelled at? All the, the painting guys. Definitely. I would, have, I would have wrote to the painting guys, this is unacceptable. I'm paying you a lot of money to do my house. You've got to pick up after yourself. You want me to give you a five-star review online and you can't even pick up after yourself? I just fell. I just fell in my bathroom before a webinar because you left your vacuum there. Right? All right. Who else would I have yelled at? Uh, the kids. Yeah. Pick up yeah. after yourselves. This is yeah. ridiculous. You are five and six years old. You want to play video games, but you can't wipe up the water? You yeah. pick up after yourselves. But I've been working on my emotional intelligence. So I like to say, Dan, this guy, Dan Siegel, I was telling you about from this book here, Mindsight. Go to YouTube. Look at everything you can find. Go to put in Dan Siegel, S. I-E-G-E-L, and look up Name It to Tame It. So he has an expression, Name It to Tame It. If you can name something, you can tame something. So Name It to Tame It. So what I do when I get angry, I number it zero to 10. So I say zero to 10, how mad am I right now? So seven below, let it go. Eight, nine, 10, get angry then. So as soon as I fell and I'm soaking wet, I'm hurt, and I've now peed my pants and my webinar is now starting in two minutes. I don't have time to take a shower. Now I got to find different clothes to put on. It, it was the whole thing was a nightmare. So I go, Janine, see, quick, zero to 10, name it, name it to tame it, zero to 10. And I'm like, this is a four because this time next year, it'll be a funny story to tell. I, I go, it's a four. I go, okay, who can I yell at? I could yell at the kids. I could yell at the guy. Whose fault is it really? It's my fault. I know I have to go to the bathroom. I'm drinking a gallon of, of water every single day. Um, I could have taken a break 15 minutes before. I could have moved that vacuum into the guest bedroom. I could have given Charlie and Jack a towel. There were many things that I could have done. Emotional intelligence is self-awareness and social awareness, self-adaptation and social motivation. How do we help ourselves be the best versions of ourselves? So name it to tame it. And you may say, well, what does this have to do with body language? It has everything to do with body language because body language is your behavior. 
It's your next behavior, your next physical move that you make. Whether you're yelling at someone, whether you're hitting something, whether you're running, whether you're frozen in time, if you can stop, pause for me, name it to tame. It could be, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm feeling angry right now. I'm wondering if I'm disappointed right now. You can name your emotion. You can do zero to 10, seven below, let it go, eight, nine, 10, get angry then, freak out then. So I use zero to 10 a lot. And what, what I've learned from psychologists is, or even if you do Tony Robbins stuff, it's a, it's a state changer. When I can just stop and name it, it's just this little teeny pause to change my state of anger, of disappointment, of sadness, whatever I might've been feeling in that moment. My, my, I have a live-in um, au pair. She came running upstairs when she heard the bang and she didn't know what happened. She goes, is everything okay? And I know what I was doing, Frederick? I was laughing hysterically. <laughs> She's, what is going on? I'm like, I just peed my pants. I'm soaking wet and I have a webinar starting in two minutes. She goes, yeah. what has happened? She was my au pair five years ago, four years ago. She goes, what happened to the Janine from four years ago to this Janine? I go, oh, when the pandemic happened, I started really working hard on my emotional intelligence, on my self-awareness and coming up with strategies that work for me that I now share with other people. So that's why emotional intelligence works for the Janine drivers of the world and for the Michael Phelps of the world. When the moment is, when stress is high, mm-hmm, what do yes. you do in those moments? I don't know if you saw this, a, a video you can hit on YouTube uh, with a guy. Um, he was the prime minister of Australia and his name's Tony Abbott. Several years yes. ago, Tony Abbott went out to the battlefield where a soldier by the name of McKinney was killed. And McKinney had a a wife and a young daughter. She was like two or three years old. And the fellow soldiers of McKinney are standing there. And the prime minister of the country, the leader of the country said, with the cameras rolling internationally, I guess shit happens, huh? What? A reporter later that same day confronts Tony Abbott and says, hey, what did you mean by what you said? And Tony Abbott goes, you mistook, you misunderstood. That's not how I meant it. People are taking it in the wrong way. And the reporter goes, well, how did you mean it? And and Tony Abbott, the prime minister, says, you people are turning this into a media circus. And the media guy goes, who? The soldiers? And Tony Abbott, the prime minister, says, no, you, the media. The media guy goes, no, I'm just giving you, Mr. Prime Minister Tony, I'm giving you an opportunity to explain. When you said, I guess shit happens, what did you mean by that statement? Tony Abbott, Freddie, and you at home, nods his head 34 times and says nothing fight, flight, or freeze response, he's in the freeze. Out of everything we all put on every single day, the thing that is judged the most is your body language. How he showed up in that moment sent a glaring message to the great people of Australia. If he can't handle this, how could he handle a 9-11 if it happened in our country? If he can't handle something like this? What Tony Abbott lacked in that moment was emotional intelligence. When the stress is high, the gear of your car will will go into the emotional intelligence gear. And if you have not practiced it and prepared it, if you don't have a strategy, you'll be another Tony Abbott. You'll be gone because he's no longer the prime minister. He was not re-voted back in. You'll be gone. Your business will be gone. So emotional intelligence is just as important, if not more important than all these fabulous business books that we read in these business seminars and these business podcasts. We should be spending at least 50% of our time learning about emotional intelligence at the same time we're learning about business strategies, sales, entrepreneurship. That's just my opinion. Yeah, no, that's a great example, Janine, because before this, um, this, this chat and this conversation, I was looking up on YouTube, the most embarrassing moments of body language of famous people. And this video showed up and uh, I encourage everyone to actually Google this, you know, on YouTube, but. I think he just froze, you know, he didn't expect that question and you could see it on him. It was like freezing, you know, he didn't know really what to say. Yeah. Yeah. That was, he lacked emotional intelligence. Yeah. Uh, I'm drinking my morning drink here, my protein drink. Just to let you know. I've got to get it in because I got to get this gallon of water in. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, keep drinking, Janine. But okay. So let's say, you know, from my perspective, when you have a good, when you want to have a good conversation with someone, you need to build rapport with that, that person. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that's one-on-one. 
in my opinion, when you're working in sales or business in general, you need to be good in building rapport with other people. What are the two, three most common mistakes people make when they intend to build a rapport with someone from your perspective? So Harvard Business Review did a, a, a study a couple of years ago and uh, or talked about a study a couple of years ago, which is when we meet someone for the first time, we're asking ourselves two questions. Um, what do you think the questions are? I'll put it out to you, Freddie. Subconsciously. So Subconsciously, you, do I like this person? Do I like okay. the way this person looks, smells, yes. and yes. feels? Do I like okay. the energy? I mean, yes. those are just some questions. Okay, good. Anything else? Do I feel safe? That's it. Okay, stop. So the first thing most people lead with is we lead with respect. You should respect me. So the two questions we're asking, I'm going to put, take it higher than what you, where you were. You hit the nail on the head is can I trust this person and can I respect this person? So what you were talking about is trust. So trust is connected to warmth and likability. Respect is connected to competence. So what we look for first in others is can I trust this person? Is this person warm and likable? Can I trust this person? Ironically though, we don't lead with being warm and likable. We lead with you should respect me, which means what? That's competence. We lead with our resume. We lead with what we've done. We lead with how I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I, um, I, whatever, you know? So for me, I try not, I'm not great at it, but I try not to lead with you should respect me. I, I love that you asked me my story of how it all came about because I get to go back and give credit to my mentors along the way. You know, I'm very transparent. One of the things you either like me or you don't like me. I'm not the kind of person you listen to this podcast and be like, eh, it was okay. You either are like, I want to be her new friend. I love her. Or you're like, she drove me crazy. But I forced myself to listen because her stuff was really cool. <laughs> I'm <laughs> enjoying this very much, Jenny. Well, thank you. Thank you. I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I have a big personality. So um, first is warmth and likability, right? Which is that trust. But we lead with our resume. I've so I've worked in the real estate industry for 22 years. I I'm on this TV show. I um, graduated from Harvard University, and we really mix that up. Um, we should be leading with warmth and likability. And I'll give you a, a, a tip on building rapport here. I'm a, I like storytelling. I love storytelling. So I'm going to give you a little example. I want you to think of the cavemen and cave women days. Okay, so uh, we're a bunch of cave people. Along comes uh, uh, Freddie here, this new cave guy, to my family unit. And am I first saying, I wonder if this new caveman, Freddie, I'm wondering if he can make a good fire. Or am I first up wondering, uh, when we go to sleep tonight, is he going to kill me and my kids and my husband, my ex-husband? You can kill the ex-husband. Just leave me and the kids alone, Freddie. Uh, just kidding. So cancel, cancel. Our subconscious has no sense of humor. So I want to cancel that out. So... Um, I'm first saying, am I safe? Can I trust this person before can he make a good fire? But many of us lead with, hey, I can make a good fire. Hey, here's my bio. Here's my education. Here's what I've done. I've accomplished tough things. Here's how much money I make a year. We, we tend to lead with that. That is important, but that is secondary. So first is warmth and likability. So my motto starting back in, I think the end of 2019, that I'm carrying through to 2021 that I invite people to consider using is ask yourself, are you being interesting or are you being interested? If you are being interesting, you are saying you should respect me. I'm competent. If you're being interesting, you're using your left brain. You're telling things. You're solving a problem. And I'll give you an example in a second. You're telling me things. That is important. But if I just have that, I'm not going to tell anyone about you. You could do a great job for me, Freddie. I love your work. You did a great job. I appreciate you, but I'm not going to tell everyone about you if I don't trust you yet. If I still don't have that great rapport with you yet, that warmth and likability. So instead of being interesting, I want you to be interested. Interested comes from the right brain. It's sitting there. It's being with them. It's asking them questions. I do an exercise. I do an um, online course called Seven Levels of Reading and Influencing Human Behavior. 
And it's a eight week course. People can take it online. If people are interested, they can, you can ask me about it later or whatever. You can tell them my website's janinedriver.com. It sells out. So, um, but I have, uh, I have them coming on every now and then. So anyway, I do this exercise in there at the beginning of every single class, every single class. And by the way, if you have any listeners that are financially struggling and really want to be in that class to boost their emotional intelligence, um, please tell them to write to me and I give scholarships for people who are financially suffering because I know my purpose on earth is to share what God has given to me. And again, I'm my best version of me serving others. So please let me know how I can serve you. I make money from all my corporate gigs. I don't need money for my online training stuff. I, I pay the bills with my corporate clients. So I want to help the world. So anyway, that's a sidebar. So I start every class with um, what's on your mind. So I'll give you an example right now, Freddie. Um, so what's on your mind today? What's going on for you? Is that a question to me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, today, I, I like I, I felt a little bit nervous before this conversation. Normally, I don't get nervous. But then as soon as uh, we started to chat, I felt very, uh, very warm, warm and fussy and very, very comfortable. Okay. So before the conversation, you got a little bit nervous and you don't normally get nervous. But once we started talking, you, you started feeling warm and comfortable. Is that what I heard? Exactly. Because it's not every day you have a conversation with a body language expert. <laughs> <laughs> not every day. Right. Right. That you have that. So what else is going on for you other than that? What, what were you doing this morning or earlier today? Uh, I had a great morning. I woke up, I meditated, journaled, um, watched some jujitsu instructions, and then I went to I went to the gym to train a little bit and listen to more podcasts of yourself that you've been to, just to, to get a feel of your energy and your story again. Then I went to the office biking. Oh that is a lot. So you've gone to the gym, you've watched some videos on jujitsu. Did you say jujitsu? Yes, jujitsu. Yes. Oh my gosh. You've meditated, you've written down thing. I mean, and, and on top of it, you are prepared. You watch videos of me, you're prepared for this webinar. You were a little nervous going into it. And then once we started talking, you felt warm and comfortable. Uh, anything else happening for you? What else is going on for you? Um... No, I think that that's pretty much it, Janine, today. Those have been the highlights, I would say. Is there anything I can do to to help you with your with your business, with your podcast, with uh with anything that you have happening in your life? Um let me think. It would be great to get Jess Itzler on the show. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. We can All talk right. about that afterwards. Okay, good. So send me a message and then I'll connect you with Jesse Itzler and we'll get we'll get Jesse Itzler on your show. We'll figure out how to make that happen. Yeah, sure. That's awesome. All right. So that's how you are interesting versus interest. I mean, that's how you are interested. Um, you say, what's on your mind? What's on your mind? What's on your mind? You go three to four levels deep. You repeat what they're saying. Some people call it first echo. Some people call it parroting. Some people call it first echo, second echo, third echo. That's what we called it in law enforcement when I was with ATF. And people just feel heard. You know, we so quickly want to go into being interesting and telling everyone about our day and what we've done. But look at how much information I found out. Literally, I don't know, that took a minute and a half of you talking. I found out a lot of information about you that I didn't know, right? So I now know you meditate. I now know you go to the gym. I now know you're interested in jujitsu. I now know you're super prepared for interviews. I now know that Sometimes you get nervous before interviews, but once you have good rapport, you start to relax and smile more and you're more warm and comfortable all by being interested. Out of everything I have done in this podcast with you today, the thing that will have the biggest impact is that exercise we just did. Way over any information or tidbits or strategies I've given you, whether it's about contempt or any other body language we might talk about or emotional intelligence. To be heard is the best gift that you can give somebody to let, let them feel that you actually hear them. So repeat what they're saying when you do that. I think that's the biggest tip on, uh, emo on um, building rapport is that, is be interested, not interesting. Um, think of the caveman. You're not, you don't, you don't want to tell them you can make a good fire before you let them know you're not going to kill them before you, when, they, when they turn their backs around. So be interested, not interesting. Um, and repeat first echo, hang out with them, look at them, really look at them, really listen to them. And at the end say, is there something I can do to help? And then follow through with that. Um, I'll give you a quick example, uh, mortgage. I work with a lot with mortgage brokers 
in the real estate industry. So if I call you and say, listen, I don't have my 20% down and you're my mortgage broker, most mortgage brokers in this moment will say, well, we, we, don't worry about it, Janine. Immediately they say, don't worry about it, Janine. We can get you something called mortgage insurance. We'll take a different view. We can get mortgage insurance. You only have to put 5% down. If you get mortgage insurance, we can make this happen. Okay, well, great. You just showed me that I should respect you because you're competent in telling me all this information, but you weren't more than li- more likable. You don't even know why I lost the money. You didn't even take a second to say, how- check in with me, have a conversation with me, right? Be- pay attention to me. S- instead of saying, oh, look, we got mortgage insurance, simply say, Janine, what's, oh, you don't have the 10%? What's going on? Don't go into solving people's problems so quickly. Relax. Name it to tame it. And you know, you can't name it to tame it if you're not listening to the story, right? Because you can name it to tame it for other people. So watch this. So um, I'm wondering if you feel frustrated by that, Janine. You say, I'm wondering, by the way, wondering. Uh, not, it seems like you're frustrated. I'm not frustrated. So don't say it seems. Say, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if you, if you feel frustrated. Yeah, I do. I'm wondering if you're disappointed. Yeah, I do feel disappointed. What happened? Do you want to talk about it? What happened? Tell me what happened. Well, my dad was going to give me 20% and my two sisters complained and they said, no, if they're not going to get the money, then I shouldn't get the money. So let me get this straight, Janine. Your dad was going to give you the money, but your two sisters complained and now your dad's not giving you the money because your sisters? Oh my gosh, what else is going on for you today? Well, I just went through a divorce two weeks ago. I got the paperwork. Now I'm a single mom. It's so much harder than I expected. I was supposed to be on this webinar 45 minutes prior to me actually getting here. But my five-year-old Jack took the almost the whole entire container of syrup, the length of my forearm, and dumped it all over his waffles and all over the dish. It was everywhere. And now it's half gone. So I had to clean it up. I'm covered in syrup. Ah. So wait a minute, Janine. Your son Jack spilled syrup all over the place. You're covered with syrup. You end up being 45 minutes late for the podcast that you're supposed to do. And you lost your 20% because your sisters complained and now your dad's not going to give it to you? Oh my gosh, what else is going on? That's it. Well, how can I help you? You know what you can help me with, Freddie? I just want this house. Is there some way that I can get the house without 20%? Yeah, let me tell you about mortgage insurance. You only have to put 5% down, Janine. Now, which version of Janine has just built rapport and become you became friends with? right? The version where you slow it down, it takes 60 seconds to be interested in somebody. Ask them the question, repeat it, layer it up, repeat it again. Like I stacked it as I repeated it. And that's where rapport is built, solidified. And it's not just rapport. You want to be on rapport. You want people to love you so much. They're going to tell everybody about you. They don't tell everybody about you until they know that you're trustworthy and trust is connected to warmth and likability. So those would be, you asked for three, but I think I kind of gave you a little more than three in there. So, you know, repeat what they're saying. I'll give you my three-step formula. So number one, be interested, not interesting. Because interesting is you should respect me. That comes later. They wouldn't be calling you if you did, if they didn't know you were a mortgage broker or whatever it is that you sell or work on, whatever service you offer. So be interested, not interesting. That's number one. Number two, by doing that, you're going to say what's on your mind. And number three, you're going to repeat it. And you're going to repeat what they say. You're going to ask them three or four times. You're going to stack it and just like I just did, repeat all the levels. And then the bonus step is you're going to say, what can I do? How can I help you? How can I help? Let them then tell you. We're out. There's a great little fable out there called The Knight in Shining Armor. It's like a 30-page book that has like size 24 font. And it'll take you literally less than 45 minutes to read it. And The Knight in Shining Armor is out there trying to solve everybody's problems everybody's problems. And eventually he can't take off his armor. And he's sitting at the dinner table wearing his armor and his wife and son leaves him because he's so busy out there trying to save everybody. It became his identity. If your identity is your product, your service, you've got it backwards. Your your identity should be connected. Just being a human being, talking to another human being. That's rapport. How was that? Was that Was that good? Yeah, I'm just digesting it. It's um, I'm thinking, you know, Janine, I think um, I've seen that play out a lot in, in you know, in my young career. Um, I also come from a blue collar family. You know, my family, they immigrated from Cambodia to Sweden. There are not many Cambodians or 
when I grew up, there were not many immigrants in Sweden, not like in the US, you know, and, um, you know, they worked in a, in a manufacturing factory and I was the first one to go to university. So when I grew up, I, I didn't have, you know, parents who, who were educated, so to speak. So I had to use, I, I mean, now I'm looking back, I guess I had to use a lot of emotional intelligence to get what I wanted or to get noticed or to get help from the teachers or to stand out a bit, you know, in the crowd. Um, and no, I was just reflecting on that. Very interesting, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think when you ask me the question, most people are like, she's a body language expert. Give us body language. Sure. You know, there's body language stuff, you know, open palm gesture, right? When you have a palm up gesture, your palm faces the sky. You're more likely to get people to tell you the truth when, when asking them a question. If people are talking to you and their palms are facing you, it's most likely they're telling you the truth. When their palms begin to face them, there's something they're withholding, something they're holding back. It might not be a lie. It might just be a tiny piece of the puzzle they don't want to share with you. Um, so there's tons of body language stuff to look for with people. If you're talking to someone and they scratch their nose with an index finger or scratch their face at all, if they touch their face, you're, you might be talking too much. So to me, when someone touches their face with an index finger and scratches their eyes, their nose, their cheek, it's an alarm for me, like a fire drill. There's been an emergency reported in the building. There's been an emergency reported in the building. Please stop talking. Over. I repeat, there's been an emergency reported in the building. There's an emergency reported in the building. Janine Driver, please stop talking. Over. So someone touches their face. These are called pacifiers. And our face holds our brain. And so when people touch their face, it's, a, it's an alarm for me. Janine, are you talking too much? And usually the answer is, yeah. So I will stop in mid-sentence. And as soon as you touch your face, I'll stop in mid-sentence. And I go, ah, enough about me. Anyway, what's going on with you? Tell me what's going on in your day. I then I, I repeat it. Then I stack it and I go three to four levels deep. And next thing you know, that person is my friend. They never walk out That's being powerful. my friend because I shared a whole bunch of awesome stuff that I know. So are there body language elements? I threw a couple in there for you for people who are tuning in for body language. They exist. Way more importantly, let's think higher. Higher level thinking. Body language comes naturally. So think of it, uh, Freddie. You didn't think about your body language when you built rapport with the teacher and you stood out. What no. you did is you worked on the roots of your tree. So I love trees. It, you, you worked on the roots of your trees. It, it, the, let's look at a tree here as a metaphor. So the roots of the tree are your intention. It's what you want. The power of intention, Dr. Wayne Dyer would call it. Simon Sinek would call it the, your why. You know, what's your why versus your what or your how. Um, the Bible calls it your purpose. What's your life's purpose or for any religious people, right? What's your purpose? Those are the roots of the tree. And that's the first step in communicating. The second step in communicating is the trunk of the tree. The trunk of the tree is body language. And the branches of the tree are, I'm stretching my hands out like I'm a tree, my branches. Uh, the branches of the tree are thought. So that means body language comes before thought. And then the leaves of the tree are the tree is words. And if you think of the, the leaves of the tree like a fruit or a nut, when they fall to the ground, it creates a new tree. Wouldn't you agree? So words are critically important and your intention is important. Mm -hmm. Your body yes. language and thought will automatically happen. It's like a domino. The thing that is the most important is your intention. Your intention probably wasn't to manipulate the teacher. Your, your intention was probably just to be seen. Just to, just to not go dis disappear, to just be valued as a human being, to whatever. What was your intention? When you, do you remember going back? What were you thinking as a kid? Um, I mean, I, I guess one, one example could have been, well, I have done my homework and it has been excellent. And I want you to see that, you know? Okay, so you and did work hard on your homework. If there are 25 other children there, I mean, I want you to know that I did it the best or among the best, you know, or the fastest, you know. Okay. Why did you want the teacher to know you did it the fastest or the best? Why was that important? I wanted to have a good mark. What would that mean to you? Uh, a good grade would mean happy parents. You want to have a good mark, a good grade. Yeah. Okay. And so a good <laughs> grade means happy parents. So yeah. your ultimate intention was what? Happy parents. Yes, exactly. I guess so. Yeah. And to do well. I've always like, I always wanted to do well, always like wanted to fulfill my potential. You know, I never wanted to slack off. 
There you go. So fulfill your potential. I want to fulfill my potential and I want my parents to be happy. They're working hard. I want them to know I'm working hard too, right? Like they're happy. They know I'm doing what I need to be doing. They, they moved to this country. They changed their lives for me. And here I am, right? Like I'm going to do my best. So happiness, self-happiness, happiness of others, right? So that's the roots of the tree. No one told you body language wise to use your palm out to get the teacher to like you more, but I bet you, you did it without realizing it. I bet you, when you told the truth, you put your palm out and said, here's the homework. Here's what I've done. You naturally did it. And I bet you, if the teacher started scratching her face without you even realizing it, you probably knew that something was not right. Something was wrong. And you just had a, you just had a feeling the teacher or your dad or your mom, that they weren't happy. You couldn't put your finger on it, but there was something. It was there. You are born with a level of emotional intelligence. And the good news is it grows and grows and grows. We already have it. We're born with something in our brain called an open loop. That's why when the baby cries, a mother can go over and help the baby stop crying. We're looking for other people to complete this open loop in our head. This is that emotional intelligence, getting to know ourselves, getting to know others. And so if you go back to the roots of the tree, yeah, body language is cool. I could talk about it all day long. It's over 5,000 body language moves. It's cool. I love it. I make a living from it. Way more importantly is hanging out in the roots of the tree because the body language will happen. Look at a video, go to YouTube, put in a video called uh, Michael Jr. Comedian Break Time. um, And the song is Amazing Grace. So Michael Jr. Comedian Amazing Grace. And he talks about the why the purpose, what I call the roots of the tree. And he has the guy sing the song, Amazing Grace. He talks to a guy in the audience on a break. The guy goes, he goes, what do you do? And the guy goes, I'm a singer. He goes, you're, I mean, I'm a music and teacher. You're a music teacher. Can you sing? The guy, his name's Daryl in the audience. Daryl goes, yes. He goes, sing me a couple bars of Amazing Grace. Daryl sings beautifully, Amazing Grace. Guess what happens? The audience likes it, they applaud. Then Michael Jr. gives him a, a secret made up purpose a storyline that doesn't even exist for this man. And he goes, can you imagine if this happened? If you just got out of jail and when you were a kid, your uncle got shot in the back. Is that version of Amazing Grace inside of you? And the man says, yes. And this time when he sings, his body language, he's moving side to side. He takes his right hand. He's raising it in the air when he sings Amazing Grace. The audience gives him a standing ovation. People stand up around him. They push him on his shoulder. That Michael Jr. did not say, lean side to side and use a hand gesture. But by changing the roots of the tree, by changing the why, by changing the purpose, the story behind the story, the body language automatically happens. If you have a, if my mother would call it stinking thinking. If you have stinking thinking, if you think negative, today's going to be one of those days. I knew it. I woke up late. I knew it was going to be one of those days. Jack poured syrup all over the plate and wasted all the syrup. And I was angry. And I knew it was going to be one of these days. And if that's your stinking thinking, you're right. Because your subconscious has no sense of humor. So when you say things that are negative, your subconscious goes to work. Your reticulating activating system, your RAS, goes to work to make that a reality for you. I never do that. I say, cancel, cancel. If I say some stinking thinking, if I go, oh, I'm so fat in this outfit, I go, cancel, cancel. You look adorable. This whole side braid, wow. You're going old school, right, Janine? Look at you. So I do cancel, cancel a lot and and I call them resets. If you have stinking thinking, do a reset because you're subconscious. You have just programmed your GPS, your personal GPS to go to a destination you actually don't want to go to. So reframe what you're saying and get back into the roots of the tree. What, anytime someone's failing in life, I bring them right back to what do they believe? What's important to them? What do you believe? What you believe is your intention. So you believe in happiness. Very deep advices. It's deep stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, so a lot of people, we're all like learning now and working remotely, right, Janine? Um, one of the biggest cons that people are saying is that it's difficult to read body language through video chats. Um, what are two or three advices on improving body language communication or video chats? Well, I don't agree with that statement. I think reading body language via, via video chat is very easily. I'm scratching as easy. I'm scratching my face right now. 
So I have sensory issues. So I move a lot and I'm very fidgety. My hair is falling out of this little braid. Um, you always want to get someone's baseline. How do they normally behave? So someone can be very fidgety and touch their face all the time. It means nothing, right? Because that's just their baseline. You're looking for a change in someone's baseline. I think the biggest tip on Zoom calls today is have people have your cameras on. I find it to be incredibly rude when someone doesn't have their camera on. And as I know, when my camera's not on in these webinars, it's because I'm doing 10 other things. It's because I'm not paying attention. Give yourself the gift of presence. Give yourself the gift of the here and now. Actually being present. Have your camera on because those are the people when I do webinars and I see the people with the cameras on, those are my favorite people. I remember their names. I remember this one guy, Vance, and one of my, he works for a mortgage banking company here in the United States called SWBC. They're amazing. If you're in the States listening to this, check out SWBC. And Vance comes every time with a bow tie. So last week's bow tie was purple. I'm like, Vance, purple today. All right. I remember Vance. Ask me how many other names I remember of the 138 people on my webinar every single month for seven levels of reading and influencing human behavior. I remember Vance. Vance talks, he shares, he's got his bow tie. So I think reading people is get their baseline, make sure people's cameras are on, of course. And reading people's faces, it's so easy. In these pacifiers, if, if I'm never touching my face and all of a sudden you say, Janine, how's it going? Are you staying within budget? And now all of a sudden I start playing with my hair you know that there's a spike in stress and anxiety. So anytime someone touches their face, it's scientifically proven. Our brain dumps a bunch of hormones. I'm going to simplify this for all of us. You touch your head or your face, even if you guys have an itch, anytime you touch your face, you have a bunch of hormones that dump into your body because what happens when we touch our face is our brains are so amazing, is it does an emotional and cognitive reset. So emotional uh, is your, say even, it's not necessarily bad. It could be, you're lying, so you touch your face. But go to a stand-up comedy show. Hit Google, watch a live audience on YouTube um, at a a stand-up comedy show. After the biggest jokes, they all touch their face or their head. They're like, oh man. They put their hand over their mouth. They cover their eyes. They pat their hair. Because why? It's a spike in emotions. Touching our face gets such a bad rap. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's doing an emotional and a cognitive reset. So cognitive is our way of thinking. Multi, like, um, you know, your kid says, um, I I don't think there's Santa Claus. There's no such thing as Santa Claus because how did Santa come to Graham and Poppy's house last year? They don't even have a fireplace, right? And you go, oh, you didn't know? Santa can shrink down into a small, tiny keyhole size with his presence, who's in in the living room and then gets bigger again. And your kid goes, no, I don't believe that. Cognition is, oh, your kid doesn't believe it coming up with another answer. So, oh, I didn't want to say anything, but um, you know how he makes the reindeers fry with that fly, with that special stuff? He puts it around grandma and poppy's house and we all floated in air. And then he came up underneath the house and your kid's like, no, mom. And he still doesn't buy it. Cognition is still coming up with other answers, pushing your brain's capacity to think of something new and new. And now you say to your kid, all right. Don't tell Graham and Poppy, but I left the door unlocked in the back. They'd kill me if they knew. And I let Santa in and I locked it when I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. That's cognition. When we touch our head in our face, there is literally an emotional and a cognitive reset. So on these webinars, you can see people touching their face. You can see contempt. You could see any of the seven universal emotions discussed. You can see anger. You can see when someone is holding something back. When we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. So Freddie, pull your lips in and go, Janine, I'm so happy you were here. I'm so happy to to have you here, Janine. And then have your lips disappear. Okay. This is emotional constraint. When someone's lips pull in, mmm. Literally, so you can no longer see your lips, pull your lips in. You at home, I believe you can't unsee, unhear, unexperience what we're talking about. So you got to experience it. So pull your lips in first, say, I'm having a great day. And then pull your lips in. So I'm having a great day. Yeah, let me say, I'm having a great day. I would be like, are you really, Freddie? So when the lips, I say, when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. So if someone's lips disappear and their eyebrows come down, and their lips get tight instead of their lips being pulled in, 
like up leopard disappears because it's so tight and I'm angry, you can spot it very quickly. By the way, in these webinars, people are getting angry. We're sick of webinars. A study just came out. Um, if you don't have to do a Zoom webinar or Google Hangout, whatever the thing is that you use, um, don't. Um, the best way for us to communicate is in person. And because of COVID and this pandemic, that seems not to be happening. It's starting more, more now than it used to. Um, people think the second best way is Zoom, and that's not true. Because I'm actually not looking at Frederick. I'm actually distracted. I'm looking at a green light on my computer screen. So he feels like I'm looking at him. And from when you watch at home, you feel like I'm looking at Freddie. When I'm not, I'm not. I'm looking at a green light at the top. And in my peripheral, I'm seeing Freddie out of the side. I'd much rather literally look at Freddie so I could see his face. So the study has come out that um, the second best way, if you can't be in person to have meetings is over the phone. Because over the phone, people can walk and talk and they can actually focus better on what you're saying. So now Freddie and I are talking, I'm walking, I'm moving, I'm listening to what he's saying. I'm not getting distracted by just forcing myself, <coughs> excuse me, to look at this green light. So stop doing the, the Zooms if you, if, you, if you can, because you're not going to get the best read on someone because they may look irritated, they may be angry, and it has nothing to do with your meeting or your topic. You're just the seventh Zoom they've done today. And they're sick of it. They're sick of it being on these Zooms. So do more phone calls, fewer Zooms. And you can still hear body language through a phone call, tone and pitch of voice. If my voice gets softer, it's indicative of sadness or disappointment. There's a problem. If my voice gets stronger, I've already said this. Freddie, we've talked about this 10 times. So of course, the obvious answer is anger. But anger is a secondary emotion to fear, anxiety, and sadness. So if you're on a group call, you may not want to call Freddie out then, but you may want to call Freddie afterward and say, is everything okay, buddy? You know, I'm wondering if you're anxious or disappointed in something, or if in fact you really were angry. Um, so that exercise I do that I talked about earlier, you know, what's on your mind, what's on your mind, what's on your mind, and you repeat it. I did this with one of my clients and he came angry and he was like uh, on the webinar. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, he goes on. You know what? My clients don't want to do that. This is the dumbest exercise. My clients don't want to do that. It's, it seems ridiculous. They want to get right to it. If they don't have the deposit you need to, I'm, not, I'm going to tell them right about mortgage insurance. They appreciate it. I don't understand why we have to do this for eight because the corp, my public classes are eight weeks in a row. Uh, my my, my uh, corporate ones are eight months, right? Three hours a month for eight months. So he goes, uh, you know, we waste our time doing this exercise. I'm never going to use it, my clients. And I go, okay, got it, Mike. So you're never going to use it with your clients uh, because your clients want to get right to it. They want to know if they want mortgage insurance. They want you to tell it. They don't want you to be building rapport with them and finding out what's going on in their life. Is that what I'm hearing? He goes, yeah. And I go, okay, what else is going on for you? And he goes, well, uh, my kids are still at home here. It's ridiculous. I wish I could go to the office. I'm getting sick of working at the house with my kids knocking on the door constantly. I can't focus. I go, ah, so now you can't even focus. Your kids are knocking on the door and your wife's watching the kids, but they keep knocking in. You can't go to the office. You're sick of it. And your clients don't want to build rapport with you. They want to get right to the solution. They're sick of it. Anything else? And he burst out crying. Oh. In front of all his peers, burst out crying. Yeah. Because his dad has COVID and his dad was going to the hospital. So... If I just treated that anger, and this doesn't have to be on Zoom and it doesn't have to be in person, I can all happen over the phone. It's still nonverbals, the tone, the pitch, right? And I said, what's going on? And, he, and I layered it again. And I go, I just did the exercise with you. Were you irritated? He said, no. I go, did I build rapport? He said, yes. I go, are you okay? He goes, yeah. It actually felt good to just vent. Anger is a secondary emotion to fear, anxiety, and sadness. So if someone is angry, stop being angry back. It's like giving the baby a bottle because he's crying and, you get, and he cries more and you give him another bottle and you give him another bottle. And you're exasperating the situation. You're making it worse. The baby was crying because he had a soiled diaper. Hello. And you keep putting a bottle in his mouth. Yeah. Our job and, and connected again, back to emotional intelligence is understand. No one teaches us this stuff. Anger is a secondary emotion of fear, anxiety, and sadness. What? 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 
No one teaches us this. It is a game changer for me. And I have a funny feeling people listening, it'll be a game changer for you too. So you can see it, you can spot it. Asking powerful questions, going back to that exercise, when you see a change in someone's behavior, they have an increase in these facial touches. No, there's an increase in emotions happening or increase in thinking. And so it, it, it does a, a reset. Ask some questions offline if you see a change in someone's behavior. If we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. And there's so many more things that you can tell in someone's face. We didn't even have time to talk about shoulder shrugging. So we'll have to do that in another interview. Yeah. I want to get it. Do you have any other questions? I think, how are we doing? We're at, we're, I think we're at the hour. We go? are, we are, Janine. I wanted to go with one last question, okay? Which is quite interesting, if, if it's okay with you. I had the pleasure to live in many different countries, China, Japan, Thailand, Spain, UK, like Sweden, and, and so on. And for example, in Spain and Italy, it's very common to use your hands when you're speaking and when you're negotiating, and especially when you're doing business, you're having business lunches. How does one look for cues to read various body language across cultures, you know, because in the US as well, like you're using your hands differently and your body yeah. differently? Yes. Um, so it, there's a great book I like out there. It's called Kiss, Bow or Hold Hands. And it's updated. <clears throat> why is my chair not mine? It's updated every couple of years. Kiss, Bow or Hold Hands. I think it has like three or four authors. And it's really great. So it talks about like if you go to China <clears throat> and you're talking to someone who's 80 versus if you're in China and you're talking to someone who's 22, You've got two different types of people here because the 22-year-old is very Americanized, Western civilizationized, right? So it's, it's going to be a, a different way to communicate. I love that book. It doesn't cover every country, of course, in the world, but it covers a lot of them. So I love that book. And um, I think one of the reasons my book, You Say More Than You Think, which you can get in a library or on Amazon, like seven bucks, I, I already got paid in advance, as you know. So if you buy the book, it's just a way that you get to continue to work with me. You don't have to buy the book. Just getting this information today and actually acting on what we're talking about, you're already a step ahead of most people, 99% of the people, is that uh, my book, I think it's been translated into so many languages and it's been so successful. In, in Japan, it's a, it's a bestseller. Um, I think partly because it's called in the United States, you say more than you think. In Japan, they translated that uh, and changed the title to FBI secrets to manipulate and control people's minds and hearts. So I always tell people, learn Japanese and buy that book, FBI secrets to manipulate and control people's minds and hearts versus you say more than you think. I think I'll pass on this one. Um, I think it's done so well is I spend a lot of time on getting someone's baseline. And, it, and you baseline a country, you baseline a community, you baseline the individual. Because there is no one way, even though, you know, uh, um, Italians may use a lot of hand gestures, not all Italians will use a lot of hand gestures. Um, so get someone's baseline when they change from their baseline. That's what we call a hotspot or a probing point. This is where you're going to ask some questions. Maybe I'm wrong here, I like to say. So I ask you, hey, Frederick, you know, um, uh, I'd love to come back again. And you go, Janine, I'd love for you to come back. And your lips disappear. You suck those lips in. Um, and you say, I'd love for you to come back and your lips disappear. Maybe it's because you don't have repeat guests within a year. Maybe it's because I was 45 minutes late because Jack, the Jack debacle with the syrup. Maybe it's because, uh, maybe I'm unable to get you Jesse Itzler. I forgot about getting you Jesse Itzler. And so you're like, forget her. If she's not helping me, who knows why your lips disappeared. Be careful of being a mind reader. Notice the hotspot, which is the change in the behavior and just simply say, Hey, Freddie, uh, maybe I'm wrong here, but when you said you'd like to have me back, it seemed like there was something you weren't saying there. What's going Thank on? Thank you. No, and that's, you might be like, oh, I, yeah, you might just be like, well, I don't have people back uh, every, you know, more than a year or twice in a year. Or um, I know your schedule's tight. Or, but notice the behavior when it changes, it's a hot spot. Just simply say, maybe I'm wrong here. But it seems to me or feels to me or sounds to me that there's, there's something you're not saying. And then WAIT, W-A-I-T. It stands for, why am I talking? Ask the question, stop talking, give it some silence, be in that right brain space. Remember, your job is to be interested, not interesting. And people who are interested can stop, pause, and listen.
I love that, Janine. And uh, let me just clarify, it would be a pleasure to have you on the second round. It would be more <laughs> than a pleasure. And I love my, my biggest takeaway on that is that to assess the baseline. I think that's important, wherever we are in the world. So yeah, for every individual, the community, the, cult, the culture, the community, the, the group and the individual. Exactly. I'm always watching the individual, watch the individual, watch how they dress, watch how they respond, watch who eats first, watch, you know, watch if you've ever watched um, like nighttime shows, start paying, become a student of, of behavior, you know, watch, just watch human beings and how we're all so different. I tend to sit at a diagonal. My right shoulder is up. My left shoulder is down. My right I noticed elbow, that. My I right noticed elbow that. is on my bureau yeah. here. Yeah, so I'm, I sit at a diagonal. That's, that's part of my baseline. I usually do talk a lot with my hands, but I haven't had a lot of hand talking because I have my protein drink right here in my lap that I was holding. And then when you started talking about the hands, a study was done, even in the United States, um, uh, TED Talks, TED Talks that have more hand gestures are watched more than the same topic, same length of time with fewer hand gestures. Now, this used to be different back in the 80s and 90s. Hand gestures in the United States were a little bit of a deterrent. They would say fewer hand gestures. Now, today that's flipped. Why? Because we're so connected to electronics. We're so connected to stimuli that you want to use hand gestures. Even if you're in the States, you should use hand gestures to keep people engaged. Even if your hand gesture doesn't match, I'm climbing a pretend ladder here as I'm talking. If your hand gesture doesn't even match what you're saying, you catch, catch people's attention. What's going on over there? What's that? What is she talking about? So using more hand gestures, the, the, keep it in the, the frame of your body. So shoulder to shoulder. If you're talking to a couple people, the bigger the audience, the bigger your hand gestures can get. But if you have a small meeting, a small uh, couple people, your hand gestures should not be outside your shoulder frame. Because when they are, you're seen as unpredictable. It's too much energy coming with people, coming at people. And I'm right now doing these huge gestures, sweeping gestures as if I'm doing a jumping jack out there. So um, it all matters. And remember, uh, you say more than you think. It's true. Thank you very much, Janine. It's been a pleasure. Where can people find out more about you and where can they go to say hello to you on social media? Uh, so on my website is my name, janinedriver.com, J-A-N-I-N-E, driver, like a taxi driver, D-R-I-V-E-R.com. On, um, you, on YouTube, I, I have a bunch of stuff up there. I do uh, every now and then a celebrity lie detector show on Facebook Live on Wednesday nights. If there's something, some big celebrity drama, I'll analyze them for a couple hours and um, tie them in with past events where people were lying and there was some drama. It's really cool. So go to YouTube, put in CLD. Stands for Celebrity Lie Detector, Janine Driver. Janine Driver, CLD. You can see all my celebrity lie detectors from the past. They're amazing. I love them. I'm proud of them. Sharing all the stuff that people in law enforcement have called and emailed me and are not happy that I'm sharing all the secrets that we are supposed to keep private in these three-letter law enforcement agencies. And uh, so check it out there. I'm also over on Instagram. It's called New Body Language. I'm New Body Language. And in Clubhouse, I'm New Body Language too. If you're if you know what Clubhouse is, I don't know if it's made it around the world yet, but if it once it gets there, I'm new body language. And uh, let me know how I can help. I'm personally or professionally, uh, I'm here to serve. So let me know how I can help you. Check me out, janinedriver.com. Send me an email, janine at janinedriver.com. That's it. Thank you very much, Janine. And I encourage everyone who's listening or watching to, uh, to check out Janine's amazing TEDx talks as well. She didn't mention that but check them out on YouTube. Uh, they're amazing. So. Thank you. Yeah, I did four. Um, two of them went viral and watched by 5 million people combined in a year and a half, which is, that's a story for another time. I've, I, I've, uh, by the way, the two that did not go viral are just as valuable as the other two. I think <laughs> I love the messages there. And it, it, it strikes me as interesting, but um, I had lost 140 pounds. And to me, all four have amazing messages. It does speak to me about the power of how the visual power of what we look like. Uh, I believe that it matters because uh, storytelling wise, technique wise, all four TED Talks have a pack of punch. They're all great stories. They're all great lessons learned throughout my life. Um, strategies that people taught me how to read and influence human behavior. And those last two, I was thinner, right? I lost 140 pounds, 120, 140 depends. Each one was different. They were four months apart, I think. 
but check out all of them, not just the ones that went viral, uh, even if you want to just listen, if you don't want to look at the chunkier version of me. Um, and now I'm back down. I'm down, I'm down 19 pounds doing this thing called 75 hard. Check it out. Hit Google. It's a game changer. It's a competition with myself. And uh, you're going to love it. Check out 75 Hard. And I'm getting ready to go back on the stage when COVID disappears and I travel around the world. I'm about to go to Asia in August. So I just got my vaccine shot my yesterday. I have a Band-Aid here. I wasn't going to get it. I was one of those people. I'm not putting it in. But if you're going to have international travel, you're going to have to have vac- be vaccinated. So Exactly. Exactly. That's it. You, got, you know, I'm going to keep talking if we don't say goodbye. So no, yeah, goodbye. I was going to say, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show, Janine. So I really appreciate your valuable time. Thank you. I say a prayer that for everyone that's listening and for you, Freddie, for your family and everyone you love, I send a prayer that God surrounds you with an army of angels uh, to protect you from this crazy coronavirus and anything else that's out there to try to harm you. I, I wish you nothing, all of you, nothing but prosperity. Thank you for listening to Fika with Rice. I hope you enjoyed the show. Who do you want to have on our show? Let us know by sending me an email at frederick at absoluteinternship.com. And before you go, if you like this conversation, don't forget to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or Spotify to get to listen to more inspirational stories and life hacks. We really appreciate it. See you next time and much gratitude for listening.